Part One. It was morning and the new sun sparkled gold across the ripples of a gentle sea. A mile from shore a fishing boat chummed the water and the word for breakfast flock flashed through the air till a crowd of a thousand seagulls came to dodge and fight for the bits of food. It was another busy day beginning. But way off alone, out by himself, beyond boat and shore, Jonathan Livingston Seagull was practising. A hundred feet in the sky, he lowered his webbed feet, lifted his beak and strained to hold a painful, hard, twisting curve through his wings. The curve meant that he could fly slowly and now he slowed until the wind was a whisper in his face, until the ocean stood still beneath him. He narrowed his eyes in fierce concentration, held his breath, forced one single more inch of curve. Then his feathers ruffled, he stalled and fell. Seagulls, as you know, never falter, never stall. To stall in the air for them is disgrace and it is dishonour. But Jonathan Livingston Seagull, unashamed, stretching his wings again in that trembling hard curve, slowing, slowing and stalling once more, was no ordinary bird. Most gulls don't bother to learn more than the simplest facts of flight, how to get from shore to food and back again. For most gulls, it's not the flying that matters, but eating. For this gull, though, it was not eating that mattered, but flight. More than anything else, Jonathan Livingston Seagull loved to fly. This kind of thinking, he found, is not the way to make oneself popular with other birds. Even his parents were dismayed as Jonathan spent whole days alone making hundreds of low-level glides, experimenting. He didn't know why, for instance, but when he flew at altitudes less than half his wingspan above the water, he could stay in the air longer with less effort. His glides ended not with the usual feet down splash into the sea, but with a long, flat wake as he touched the surface, with his feet tightly streamlined against his body. When he began sliding into the feet-up landings on the beach, when practising the length of his slide in the sand, his parents were very much dismayed indeed. Why, John, why, his mother asked, why is it so hard for you to be like the rest of the flock? Why can't you leave low flying to the pelicans, the albatross? Why don't you eat, John? You're bone and feathers. I don't mind being bone and feathers, Mum. I just want to know what I can do in the air and what I can't. That's all. I just want to know. See here, Jonathan, said his father, not unkindly. Winter isn't far away. Boats will be few, and the surface fish will be swimming deep. If you must study, then study food and how to get it. This flying business is all very well, but you can't eat a glide, you know. Don't you forget that the reason you fly is to eat. Jonathan nodded obediently. For the next few days, he tried to behave like the other gulls. He really tried screeching and fighting with the flock around the piers and the fishing boats, diving for scraps of fish and bread. But he couldn't make it work. It's all so pointless, he thought, deliberately dropping a hard-won anchovy to a hungry old gull chasing him. I could spend all this time learning to fly. There's so much to learn. It wasn't long before Jonathan Gull was off by himself again, far out at sea, hungry, happy, learning. The subject was speed, and in a week's practice he learned more about speed than the fastest gull alive. From a thousand feet, flapping his wings as hard as he could, he pushed over into a blazing steep dive towards the waves and learned why seagulls don't make blazing steep power dives. In just six seconds he was moving 70 miles per hour, the speed at which one's wing goes unstable on the upstroke. Time after time it happened, Careful as he was, working at the very peak of his ability, he lost control at high speed. When he came to, it was well after dark, and he floated in the moonlight on the surface of the ocean. His wings were ragged bars of lead, but the weight of failure was even heavier on his back. He wished feebly that the weight could just be enough to drag him gently down to the bottom and end it all. As he sank low in the water, a strange hollow voice sounded within him. There's no way around it. I'm a seagull. 
I'm limited by my nature. If I were meant to learn so much about flying, I'd have charts for brains. If I were meant to fly at speed, I'd have a falcon's short wings and live on mice instead of fish. My father was right. I must forget this foolishness. I must fly home to the flock and be content as I am, as a poor limited seagull. The voice faded and Jonathan agreed. The place for a seagull at night is on shore. And from this moment forth, he vowed, he would be a normal gull. It would make everyone happier. He pushed wearily away from the dark water and flew towards land, grateful for what he'd learned about work-saving low-altitude flying. But no, he thought, I'm done with the way I was. I'm done with everything I learned. I'm a seagull like every other seagull and I will fly like one. So he climbed painfully to a hundred feet and flapped his wings harder, pressing for shore. He felt better for his decision to be just another one of the flock. There would be no ties now to the force that had driven him to learn. There would be no more challenge and no more failure. And it was pretty just to stop thinking and fly through the dark towards the lights above the beach. Dark, the hollow voice cracked in alarm. Seagulls never fly in the dark. Jonathan was not alert to listen. It's pretty, he thought. The moon and the lights twinkling on the water, throwing out little beacon trails through the night, and also peaceful and still. Get down. Seagulls never fly in the dark. If you were meant to fly in the dark, you'd have the eyes of an owl. You'd have charts for brains. You'd have a falcon's short wings. There in the night, a hundred feet in the air, Jonathan Livingston Seagull blinked. His pain, his resolutions vanished. Short wings, a falcon's short wings. That's the answer. What a fool I've been. All I need is tiny little wings and all I need is to fold most of my wings away and fly on just the tips alone. Short wings! He climbed 2,000 feet above the Black Sea and without a moment for thought of failure and death, he brought his forewings tightly into his body, left only the narrow sweep of daggers of his wingtips extended into the wind and fell into a vertical dive. The wind was a monster roar in his head. 70 miles per hour, 90, 100, 120 and faster still. The wing strain, now at 140 miles per hour, wasn't nearly as hard as it had been before at 70 and with the faintest twist of his wingtips he eased out of the dive and shot above the waves, a grey cannonball under the moon. He closed his eyes to slits against the wind and rejoiced. 140 miles per hour and under control. If I dive from 5,000 feet instead of 2,000, I wonder how fast. His vows for a moment before were forgotten, swept away in the great swift wind. Yet he felt guiltless, breaking the promises he'd made himself. Such promises are only for the gulls that accept the ordinary. One who has touched excellence in his learning has no need for that kind of promise. By sunup, Jonathan Gull was practising again. From 5,000 feet, the fishing boats were specks in the flat blue water. Breakfast flock was a faint cloud of dust circling. He was alive, trembling ever so slightly with delight, proud that his fear was under control. Then without ceremony, he hugged in his forewings, extended his short angled wingtips and plunged directly towards the sea. By the time he'd passed 4,000 feet, he'd reached terminal velocity. The wind was a solid beating wall of sound against which he could move no faster. He was flying now straight down at 214 miles per hour. He swallowed, knowing that if his wings unfolded at that speed, he'd be blown into a million tiny shreds of seagull. But the speed was power and the speed was joy. And the speed was pure beauty. He began his pull out at a thousand feet, wingtips thudding and blurring in the gigantic wind, the boat and the crowd of gulls tilting and growing meteor fast directly in his path. He couldn't stop. 
He didn't know yet even how to turn at that speed. Collision would be instant death, and so he shut his eyes. It happened that morning then, just after sunrise, that Jonathan Livingston Seagull fired directly through the centre of breakfast flock, taking off 212 miles per hour, eyes closed, in a great roaring shriek of wind and feathers. The gull of fortune smiled upon him this once, and no one was killed. By the time he'd pulled his beak straight up into the sky, he was still scorching along at 160 miles per hour. When he'd slowed to 20 and stretched his wings again at last, the boat was a crumb on the sea, 4,000 feet below. His thought was triumph. Terminal velocity, a seagull at 214 miles per hour. It was a breakthrough, the greatest single moment in the history of the flock. And in that moment, a new age opened for Jonathan Gull. Flying out to his lonely practice area, folding his wings for a dive from 8,000 feet, he set himself at once to discover how to turn. A single wingtip feather, he found, moved a fraction of an inch, gives a smooth sweeping curve at tremendous speed. Before he learnt this, however, he found that moving more than one feather at that speed will spin you like a rifle ball, and Jonathan had flown the first aerobatics of any seagull on earth. He spared no time that day for talk with other gulls, but flew on past sunset, he discovered the loop, the slow roll, the point roll, the inverted spin, the gull bunt and the pinwheel. When Jonathan Seagull joined the flock on the beach, it was full night. He was dizzy and terribly tired. Yet in delight, he flew a loop to landing with a snap roll just before touchdown. When they hear of it, he thought, of the breakthrough, they'll be wild with joy. How much more there is to living, instead of our drab slogging forth and back to the fishing boats, there's reason to life. We can lift ourselves out of our ignorance. We can find ourselves as creatures of excellence and intelligence and skill. We can be free. We can learn to fly. Part two. They came in the evening then and found Jonathan gliding peaceful and alone through his beloved sky. The two gulls that appeared at his wings were pure as starlight, and the glow from them was gentle and friendly in the high night air. But most lovely of all was the skill with which they flew, their wingtips moving a precise and constant inch from his own. Without a word, Jonathan put them to his test, a test that no gull had ever passed, he twisted his wings, slowed to a single mile an hour above the stall. The two radiant birds slowed with him smoothly, locked in position. They knew about slow flying. He folded his wings, rolled and dropped into a dive to 190 miles per hour. They dropped with him, streaking down in flawless formation. At last he turned that speed straight up into a long vertical slow roll. And they rolled with him smiling. He recovered to level flight and was quiet for a time before he spoke. Very well. Who are you? We're from your flock, Jonathan. We are your brothers. The words were strong and calm. We've come to take you higher, to take you home. Home I have none. Flock I have none. I am outcast. And we fly now at the peak of the great mountain wind, Beyond a few hundred feet, I can lift this old body no higher. But you can, Jonathan, for you have learned. One school is finished, and the time has come for another to begin. As it had shined across him all his life, so understand ignited that moment for Jonathan Seagull. They were right. He could fly higher, and it was time to go home. He gave one last long look across the sky, across that magnificent silver land where he'd learned so much. I'm ready, he said. And Jonathan Livingston Seagull rose with the two star-bright gulls to disappear into the perfect dark sky. Part 3 
Fletcher Lynn Seagull was still quite young, but already he knew that no bird had ever been so harshly treated by any flock or with so much injustice. I don't care what they say, he thought fiercely, and his vision blurred as he flew out towards the far cliffs. There's so much more to flying than just flapping around from place to place. A, a mosquito does that. One little barrel roll around the elder gull, just for fun, and I'm an outcast. Are they blind? Can't they see? Can't they think of the glory that it will be if we really learn to fly? I don't care what they think. I'll show them what flying is. I'll be pure outlaw, if that's the way they want it. And I'll make them so sorry. The voice came inside his own head. And though it was very gentle, it startled him so much that he faltered and stumbled in the air. Don't be harsh on them, Fletcher Seagull. In casting you out, the other gulls have only hurt themselves. And one day they will know this. And one day they will see what you see. Forgive them and help them to understand. An inch from his right wing tip flew the most brilliant white seagull in the world, gliding effortlessly along, not moving a feather, at what was very nearly Fletcher's top speed. There was a moment of chaos in the young bird. What's going on? Am I mad? Am I dead? What is this? Low and calm, the voice went on within his thought, demanding an answer. Fletcher Lynn Seagull, do you want to fly? Yes, I want to fly. Fletcher Lynn Seagull, do you want to fly so much that you will forgive the flock and learn and go back to them one day and work to help them know? There was no lying to this magnificent, skilful being, no matter how proud or how hurt a bird was Fletcher Seagull. I do, he said softly. Then Fletch, the bright creature, said to him, and the voice was very kind, Let's begin with level flight.